Good morning. Welcome to Community Church of Chesterland, where no matter where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, as it said, my name is Ryan, and I'm excited to be here with you this morning. I am working through the ordination process with the United Church of Christ, and as part of that, we're all assigned a mentor. And I have been blessed and lucky enough to be assigned the pastor of this church, Jess, as my mentor, which is how I got here today, um, filling in for them as they are on vacation. For our moment of focus comes from the book, The Towering Trees and Talented Slaves, Jesus' Parables. We have presumed the weeping and gnashing of teeth to be hell. And so perhaps it is. That is, the hell on earth experienced by those rejected by the dominant culture. In the shadows where the light of the royal courts never shine. On the mean streets outside the great households. The dwelling place of the outcast poor like Lazarus. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Open yourself to the song. Open yourself to the song. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Open your hearts, everyone. Open your hearts, everyone. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Don't be afraid of some change. Don't be afraid of some change. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Who have been in church for a long enough time have probably heard Jesus' parables over and over again. And even today, when reading this passage, there may be some of you sitting out there thinking, oh, I've heard this one 10 times before. Don't hide your talents, use your gifts for God, we get it. But hang with me for a second. Sally McFaig wrote a book on metaphors and theology. And in it, she said that metaphors have a tendency to have a limited lifespan because they either become too removed from their original context to make any sense or they've been around for so long that people literalize them, and they forget that they were a metaphor meant to teach something bigger than itself. A parable is like a metaphor that is in story form. It is meant to surprise us, to disorient us, to shock us. It is meant to pull the rug out from under a belief we have that has gone unchallenged for so long that we do not even realize we believe it. Ultimately, it is designed to reveal a truth about reality that we previously ignored, forgotten, or had yet to be discovered. Some of Jesus' parables were so shocking that the religious leaders sought to arrest him for even teaching them. So if you hear a parable and it seems old and stale, one or both of these things has probably happened. It has either become too removed from its original context 
to make much sense to a modern person, or has become like a literal belief and it no longer points to a larger truth to the listener. So yes, if you've been around church long enough, there is a good chance you may have heard this parable of the talents, perhaps even several times over. I know I have. But the most common conclusion, the big reveal of the parable that is supposed to shock us into a new way of seeing things, is that we should not hide our talents or God will be disappointed in us. And conversely, if we let our talents shine, we will get even more talents or blessings or something along that line. I don't know about you, but I don't find this to be particularly shocking. And I don't think the people in the first century were surprised that they should use their skills to openly serve God. That means likely something else is going on in this passage that we are missing. If we recontextualize this parable in a modern setting, we might start to see things that are, in fact, surprising. So trying to figure out exactly what a talent of money is is an exercise in averages and a little bit of guessing. But there seems to be a relative consensus that one talent would be equal to 16 years of the common person's wages. Now, for Chesterlands, the per capita income is about $40,000. So this would mean that if this story were to happen here today, that the first servant got about $3.2 million entrusted to them, and the next, $1.28 million, and the last one, $640,000. That means the head of this house entrusted a total of about $5,120,000 to the three servants. Now, I don't want to bog us down in math, but this means that the first servant brought back $6.4 million, and the second brought back $2.5 million, and the third simply returned the original $640,000. I don't know about you all, but the idea of a boss handing me that much money and basically demanding I double it by the time he got back, I might probably just bury it somewhere too. But this practice, however, was relatively common among the wealthy class in Jesus' time. Though the amount of money in this this specific passage does seem to be a bit extreme. The wealthiest estates would have slaves and servants that had their own hierarchy that was based a lot on trust, with the servants of the highest status having proven themselves loyal over time. These servants in our passage were given a certain amount of money while the master was traveling. Again, a fairly common practice among the wealthiest estates. Most likely, the master in this story was traveling to go make more business deals. Often, these were highly exploitative in nature and included actions like foreclosing on other estates that that master would then take over. You may be familiar with modern iterations of this, as this was typically a process where the wealthiest estate masters would act through a series of political moves to make it too expensive for a lesser master to own their own estate. The wealthier master would essentially loan the other enough money to keep living on that estate, but the loan would run out eventually, and the estate itself was automatically collateral for the loan. So the wealthier master could collect on the loan by taking over that estate and turning it into another profit machine for his own bank account. It was during one of these trips that our passage takes place. In this practice, the servants were charged with doubling the money entrusted to them. Then typically anything that they were able to get above that doubling, they were able to keep for themselves. So there was a large incentive for these servants to succeed. 
But to complicate matters, this money was considered a loan. And to clear the loan, they had to bring back the original amount plus a certain percentage. Or they could be on the hook for the interest on the loan that they were forced to take in the first place in order to make their master more money. Suffice it to say that the master was exploiting his most trusted servants, and this money wasn't some form of benevolent loan. They could be punished for making their master too little profit. So, of course, the servant that was given the most and came back with the most is the hero of the story, right? Well, this conclusion seems to be a bit too mundane for one of Jesus' parables. And the master is starting to sound like not so nice of a guy. William Herzog, in his book, Parables as Subversive Speech, actually names the last servant, the one who buried the money, as the hero of the story. Now that might actually sound a little surprising, especially when many of us has heard this parable interpreted as the master representing God and the person hiding the talent as the person in the wrong. But Herzog argues that it was the final servant that is the hero of the story, and that when he said, quote, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. That the servant was actually accurately describing his master. The servant wasn't making an excuse The master was, in fact, making his riches off work that he did not do. Not only that, he gave this ill-gotten money to the servants with the expectation that they would double it and bring it back to him or possibly face financial or worse punishments. Now, the ideology of this master in this story reminds me of one of my favorite social media accounts that has a series called Canadian Real Estate versus Actual European Castles. Now, in this series, the host shows property listings in Canada that often have run down 1,500 square foot houses on a quarter acre property that are selling for astronomical numbers, often for $4 million or more. Then he will compare that listing to an actual European castle that is in amazing shape and is as picturesque as you would think a well-maintained, livable castle will be, with sprawling properties that are selling for the same amount as the dilapidated property in Canada. Now, typically, there will be a few real estate agents who come in who comment that the Canadian properties are being sold as investing opportunities for future development. In other words, the listings are based on what they could possibly be worth someday, assuming the stubborn and complicated zoning is able to be changed assuming there is an actual interest in developing the property, and assuming a developer is found, the project is completed, and the business and or housing then is filled and profitable. Simply put, the properties are being sold purely as speculative investments, and therefore it makes perfect sense that they cost as much as a literal European castle. Right? The comment sections on those videos almost unanimously do not think so. The real estate agents that try to justify the pricing often get sufficiently roasted. Because this kind of speculative reasoning seems like magical thinking. And the real prices that are coming from this magical thinking are making the overall housing market get more expensive and harder to participate in. And who suffers the most? Typically the people with the least amount of money. Now many agents also get angry at these practices being exposed as they are becoming increasingly unpopular the more that the common public finds out about them. 
And many towns are actually starting to take actions against the real estate agencies for attempting to sell these properties on a speculative value. The businesses the master in our story was involved in were similarly exploitative. And the servant recognized that this was just an exploitation on an exploitation on an exploitation. And as the kids these days say, he read his master for filth. He dressed him down. He dissed and dismissed him. He said straight to his master's face that he made his money strictly from exploiting people, and he refused to participate and shoved that money back in his master's hands. Now the master got angry, and it wasn't just because the servant didn't participate in what he was expected to do, but the master was also angry that the servant named the racketeering out loud. In its simplest terms, without the wordy, jargon-filled explanations that people in his position would use to justify their actions. Just like the real estate agencies are getting angry that people are exposing what they are doing without complicated jargon and word salad explanations they use to justify their prices. What's more is the master's response when he says, quote, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? It has that mob boss feel of, oh, you know who I am, and yet you dare respect me in my own house? The servant said the unspeakable thing out loud. They named the elephant in the room. The master wasn't a genius businessman. They were just really good at exploitation, and the master doesn't even contest that. This makes Jesus' concluding words from the businessman far more biting and condemning. For he said, for all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from them who have nothing, even what they do have will be taken away. Jesus wasn't using this parable to show that if you use your skills and gifts to better the world, that you will get rewarded with riches or praise or blessings or more talents or whatever. Instead, Jesus used this parable to critique the system of oppression that was making the rich richer and the poor poorer. Jesus used this parable to cut through all the nonsense justifications and con and complicated explanations for why the system was per perfectly fine and, you know, actually good if you just think about it the right way. If you aren't convinced yet, the final line should be what gets through loud and clear. Quote, as for this worthless slave, throw him out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Remember, this would have been one of the master's most trusted servants, tested over many years, and found to be loyal and trustworthy of the master's most personal confidence. But the second he refused to increase the bank account of his already obscenely rich master and plainly named his master's behavior, he was condemned as worthless. Worthless and thrown out into the streets with nothing and no second chance. This master saw people's value, even those he most trusted, as being wrapped up in how much money they could bring him. I think this makes the master's praise of the obedient servants start to sound a bit gross. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave, you have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. First, the master reminds the person of their station. Well done, slave. Second, 
80 years of wages being turned into 160 years of wages is a few things. And third, enter into the joy of your master. This sounds nice and all, but traditionally the servants chosen to participate in this business arrangement were already thought to be trustworthy and well-liked. But this master seemed to retain his approval until they brought him back obscene amounts of money. They literally had to buy their way into his good graces. And frankly, I don't know that this is the kind of person you want to be known as being on good terms with. This parable is grouped with several other parables that describe the realm of heaven. So for our conclusion, let us end with some quick rephrasings of this passage. The realm of heaven is like a servant that was commanded to enrich his greedy master, but instead chose to sacrifice their own life in order to expose the injustice and oppression of the rulers of the world. The realm of heaven is like an honest servant that refused to exploit his neighbors and instead exposed the very system that called for their exploitation. The realm of heaven brings the truth to light and inspires even servants to become truth sayers, an enemy of worldly treasures. So let us go out into this week as citizens of the realm of heaven and search for and plainly name and confront injustice and work to dismantle the systems of oppression that we find. Let us stand up to the powers of this earth and force them to face the plain truth of their actions. Let us all be as brave as the servant in our passage today, who gave up wealth and status in exchange for the truth and opportunity to disrupt their neighbor's exploitation. Amen. Arise, the light is come, the Spirit calls, obey. Show forth the glory of your God which shines on you today. Arise, your light is come, fling wide the prison doors. Proclaim a captive liberty, good tidings to the poor. Arise, your light is come, all you in sorrow born. Bind up the broken-hearted ones and comfort those who mourn. Arise, your light is come, the mountains burst in song. Rise up like eagles on the wing, God's powers will make us strong. Divine spirits of liberation. Go with the divine spirit of peace and go with the divine spirit of love. Amen. I'm trying to hold my breath Let it stay this way Can't let this moment end You set off a dream in me 
getting louder now can you hear it echoing take my hand will you share this with me cause darling without you all the shines of a thousand spotlights all the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough never be enough towers of gold are still too little these hands could hold the world but it'll never be enough never be enough for me Never, 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 never for me, for me, never enough, never enough, never enough for me, for me, for me. of a thousand spotlights all the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough never be enough towers of gold are still too little these worlds can hang the world but it'll never be enough never be enough for me never